uh, ham pineapple. Oh, ham pineapple is one of my favorites. Yeah, I love it. The the local Domino's here knows me by first name. <laughs> it's okay, did I give you permission? Uh, yeah, I can share my screen now. Okay, can you record? I am recording. Okay. I've been recording for like five minutes. You know, we got a complaint on YouTube. Did I tell you this? No. We got a complaint on YouTube that you and I chat too much. The woman was like, I'm here to learn. Yes. And this is just two friends giggling. Podcast. <laughs> so I opened up the video to see like when the teaching actually started, like when we actually had a real conversation. And we didn't start actually talking about stuff until 16 minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> You can fast forward the podcast. I was like, man, if I had come to this to learn something, I would be pissed as well. <laughs> hey, it's your show. You can do it how you want. That's right. I do what I want. I mean, I uh, for fun. <laughs> I was having a great time. Which one was it? It was our first Q&A. Oh, yeah. They probably didn't leave a name, did they? No, they did. They oh, totally really? did. They talked back and forth. We had a good conversation on the YouTube comments about it. Oh, wow. We <laughs> did talk for a long time on that one. 16 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think we've gotten a little bit better. Not really. <laughs> Try and give us some credit. As we sit here and chat on this recording. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> listeners. Oh, man. Never let it be said that we take ourselves too seriously. Um, okay, we're you doing... You take seriously, though. What'd you say? Die Hard. Oh, Die yeah. Hard, serious. Die Hard. So let's just go ahead and put the character's name in here. John McLean. McLean. Did Not I spell McLean. it wrong? McLean. 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 That's what I said. I take this seriously. You said it. But you didn't type it. Yeah. One might uh -oh. say that we're diehard, diehard fans. Uh oh, 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 that's really funny. You know, I do have to say, I watched it for the first time uh, in a long time this morning. And um, I was surprised watching it for like character voice. He's kind of an a hole. <laughs> um, that's the whole premise of the movie. I didn't realize. How many it. times have you watched it and you're just now figuring it out? Oh, man. The way he talks to his wife, I was like, you're the worst. There's a reason she left him and changed her name. <laughs> and this is, I've seen it like a thousand times. And this is the first time I watched it for character voice. And I was like, man, John McClane's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> He's awful. I always just skip to the fun parts where he's like, you know, diving down elevator shafts and <laughs> jumping off the sides of buildings. He's always funnier when he's talking to himself. Yeah, that's right. He's all just, hey, we're going to go ahead and put that in. <laughs> always funnier when talking to self. Uh, okay, so let's do our, th we're on Sorry, let me get to the point of tonight. I thought tonight would be fun because I find it helpful to, when we're talking about like characterization, I find it helpful to like talk through the characterization of um, characters we know because it kind of helps us build some skills for uh, when we're building characters from scratch, right? Like, cause if we can fill out a character we have for characters we know, we can, we can uh, it makes it easier to work through it. So uh, let's start with general character details. What do we know about John McClain? Uh, New York City police officer. NYC cop. So yeah. what is he at about uh, 40 years old in that, in that in that character role? I don't know. That's a great question. How old do you think he's supposed to be? I'd say mid 30s mid-30s yeah. late 30s he's got two very little kids yeah 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 mid to late 30s um he's uh his wife left him six months ago took the kids moved across the country <laughs> took the kids 
<laughs> moved to LA. Um, and he's on he's on vacation, uh, Christmas vacation. Visiting the visiting them for the first time. Yep. Yeah, it was fun. Um, anything else we we need to say about uh, John McClane's character details? Uh, he smokes. Yeah, <laughs> smokes. Drinks heavily, seems. I don't know. I never saw him drinking. Did you, anybody else see him drinking? Not in. The, we don't see that until the neck until three. I'm jumping movies. You're right. Yeah, that that happens yeah. in three. Yeah, that's that's why I thought. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he smokes. I mean, I would I would agree with that, but I don't think we saw that. No, we don't. He's afraid yeah. of flying. I'm sorry, Faye. What did you say? He's afraid of flying. Yeah, he's afraid of flying. He also doesn't like tall buildings. <laughs> he says it multiple times. <laughs> in fact, it, one line in the movie I noticed today was, this is the last time I go up in a tall building. <laughs> and I, I heard it, I was thinking, I was like, how do you control that? Anyway, <laughs> I was like, at some point. Especially living in New York. Yeah, at right. some point, somebody in New York is going to call you to the 40th floor. All right, anything else we know about uh, Mr. McLean? He's a little bit of a flirt with... No, that was the next movie, too. Never mind. That's two. No, he's in yeah. this one. He's he's super flirtatious in this one. Well... With whom? He's got wandering eyes. Let's say that. There's a scene in the airport where he's, like, checking out women as he walks by. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I was thinking, but... And then another one in the next movie, he's a little bit more so. So yeah, yeah, yeah totally checking out women. Um, he's super closed personality. He's super closed off to people. He's just. It takes poor Argyle, the limo driver, like thirty-five minutes to get this dude to talk. <laughs> But also, he sits in the front seat of the limo instead of the back where he could be alone. Yeah, that's true. What does that say about him? That's he weird. a control freak. Ah. Which is why his wife left him. Interesting, because yeah. I do the same thing. I don't, I don't get in the back of a cab. I think it's weird. But yeah. we see that control through the whole movie. There's also kind of an everyman attitude combined with that. Like, uh, I'm just everyday Joe. Mm -hmm. Right. Type thing. Well, he's, and he's also pretty skeptical of the, of his, uh, the fellow passenger on the airplane. <laughs> when he's talking about, you know, uh, scrunching his feet in carpet or something. Yep. Fists with your toes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he has a healthy uh, skepticism for that guy. Yeah. So that's paired with the everyman because that guy is a business professional. Oh, that's true. He is that blue he's blue collar. He thinks that like that's the way that you should be, which is why he's so frustrated with his wife moving to LA and taking a corporate job. Cuz that's yeah. like she's trying to move up in class and he's like, "But we're fine just the way we are." So it's like that control freak with like, this is who we are. This is what we should be happy with. I'm a cop. I'm proud. Of, I'm proud to be a cop. Yeah. Which comes yeah. across as Jeff, what you said earlier, he's an asshole. He's unyielding, which makes him an excellent cop, makes him really, really hard to be married to. Yeah. I actually had a thought as I was watching the movie, I was like, the only time I actually want to meet this character is in the middle of a terrorist invasion. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't want to see, like, I don't want him pulling me over on the side of the road. Like, I <laughs> the only time I want to see him. And they keep that true all the way through the whole franchise. Every movie, he gets worse and worse because he doubles down on to that the only place where he has a shining glimmer of hope is in the second movie 
And what moment is that? He's he's back together with his wife and yeah. everything he's doing, he's doing to protect his wife. Yeah, that's super true. Yeah. That's like his only redeeming moment of hope. When he when they get back to three, she's back in LA, he's back in New York, he's drunk all of the time. Yeah. And then in four, he's stalking his daughter. And then in five, he's a complete asshole to his son, not acknowledging that his son has any skill at all. And then they take a swim in Chernobyl. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else we need to see, say about his personality? We've got, he's flirtatious. He's got wandering eyes. He's closed off. He's a control freak. He's got this everyman blue collar attitude. He's skeptical of business people in power. He really trusts no one. He's proud to be a cop. He's uh, he's an unyielding a hole, and he always doubles down. He also has a bit of a of a he's a bit of a joker sometimes. Yeah. That the comedy is his um, release valve. Yeah. The the more tense the situation gets, the more he uses that humor to keep himself on even keel. Yeah, I noticed, and we'll get into this, I think, when we talk about voice, but he only makes jokes when he's winning. When he's like, when it's like life or death, or he's like running away, it's not funny anymore. <laughs> but when he's winning, all of a sudden, he's like Mr. Jokester. Um, or when the stakes are relatively low. So like when he's yeah. in the air ducts, he's going to make a joke there. Yeah. See, but he thinks he's gotten away. That's why he's making a joke. Because he thinks it's funny. Yeah. When he thinks he's like finally escaped, he'll talk about being a rat. But then when he finds out that they're below him with a machine gun, he's not he's not joking anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's like all of a sudden quiet. Yeah. All right. Anything else we want to put in his personality notes? You notice he treated... Um the cops differently he, yeah. was, he was pals with pal but he had no respect for the uh the chief or the fbi right and that oh, no, goes that right back to that every man blue collar attitude mm -hmm. which is yep. Those of us who are boots on the ground know what this is like. Everybody else is just an idiot. Yeah. But the desk jockey cop. Mm-hmm. They're, they're I'm like afraid that uh, McLean and I would get along just fine. <laughs> <laughs> but don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. That's a good note. That's really good on his personality. Okay, so we've got personality notes. We got a good feel for who this dude is and what he's going to do. Um, so let's, what emotional states do we want to cover with Mr. McLean? Oh, I froze the wrong thing. I was trying to freeze the um, row and I froze the column instead. One well, I, I think it's interesting how he's he's making the effort to take time off to go visit the wife and the kids. But right away, he starts an argument. Yeah. So I'm not really sure how we would, you know, annotate that, but um, it's almost like he... He's making himself do that and then creates an excuse to make it fail. So yeah. this is one of those times where instead of the emotional points, um, I might think about it as um, the relationships he's talking to. Um, so like his wife, who's a known entity, his the, the bad guys, and the cops because we don't actually ever see his baseline voice um because he doesn't speak 
Yeah, and I'm going to say talking to that like blue collar crowd he likes. Because he's the same with um, he's the same with Al, the cop, that he is with Argyle, the limo driver. Yes. Once he recognizes that Argyle used to be a taxi cab driver. Yep. Now he's like, oh, we're buddies. Right. But differently than the relationship that he has with his wife. Yeah. So, Ta uh, Sully, you make a really good point about talking with his wife. But I don't think it's intentional that he's trying to start something with her. I think it's that place where he just falls back into old patterns. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we all kind of do that when we when we're in a relationship that we've been in for a really long time before we even realize it. Like we're saying and doing things that we've always said and done. And and like they say it like we're we had the same argument six months ago right so i think that's a really astute point it's almost like he doesn't want to you know admit that he might have just been completely wrong yeah well and i think that there's some turmoil that he's dealing with there too like he doesn't want to admit that he's wrong even though he might have been, but at the same time, like he had an expectation for what his life was going to be with his wife and his children, and she changed the game. Right. So, like, and you know, people change over time, and we have to make a decision are we going to double down or are we going to change with them? And true to his character, every time he has a conversation with her, he doubles down. He does it in the um, in the limo on the way there. He does it in um, in the office when he sees her maiden name on the door, which mm -hmm. ironically is actually what saves her. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So. And you see this kind of need to be in control with him where like he refuses to call her mm -hmm. to let her know. Like she has no idea if he's actually coming in or not. Because he's like refusing to call <laughs> to say I got on the plane. Yeah. Um, any other voice notes? If we were writing a book with his voice and we were going to write um, write a uh, a um, uh, chapter with him and his wife, how would we describe his voice? It almost seems like, um, how would you describe, he doesn't, he doesn't really raise his voice, but he, he takes on this, um, you know, ex exhausted, here we go again, sort of, you know, almost like it, he just doesn't even want to go there. It kind of just, kind of just, uh, you know, drains out of him sort of, sort of thing. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I think you're, I think you're spot on. He has this kind of like, um, victimized exhausted language he uses mm -hmm. with her yeah it's almost it's almost like exaggerated they're like oh my god not again you know sort of thing yeah is yeah, this totally. spread going to be available to us after this yeah sure cool yeah yeah so we've got he's not going to admit that he's wrong he's picking fights and he's argumentative uh, he needs to be in control of the conversation. So like if I'm writing him in a talk with his wife, I'm going to have him saying things that tries to like one up her and put her above. Um, he's doubling down on things. He won't let things go. He doesn't yell or raise his voice, uh, but he does have this exaggerated, exhaust and victimized language. And then I'd also say he's very dismissive. There's an um, air of superiority he has. Yeah. Um, See, and I think that's, it, you think that's almost like he, he secretly harbors, like he, he might have a chance to actually change her mind and get her back. Um, so I think that he actually really does love her. And she clearly still loves him. I mean, we see that throughout the movie. But like, there's this, it's that battle of will they or won't they? 
through the whole thing. So I think each one of them secretly hopes that the other will give up what they want. Mm -hmm. You know, if he loves me enough, if she loves me enough, they'll come around to my way of thinking as opposed to finding a way to meet in the middle. Um, right. And I mean, they as much as tell us that in their first conversation on the phone. Um, but yeah, it's this, it's, it's very much that, um, Jeff, you wrote it down earlier. It won't, you won't let things go, right? Like I, I'm digging in, I'm doubling down. You're going to, yeah. you, eventually you're going to see that I'm right. And you're going to come crying back to me, which is why he hasn't seen her for six months or the kids for six months, because he thought she was going to go out to LA and fail. Yeah. Right. And it is interesting, like, you know, writing, like talking about writing his voice, there's this thing where he's in the limo at the beginning of the movie with Argyle, which I don't know how they never make a joke about that guy's name, but he's in the limo with Argyle and he's talking about Argyle's like, I'll wait for you if your woman takes you in. And he seems, McLean seems very positive that like, yeah, that's what I want. I want to go home with my wife and then she offers him to come home she's like why don't you just stay with us and is clearly coming on to him and then out of nowhere he's like why did why did you change your name like <laughs> so there's almost this like self-destructive like what laura was saying this like need to be in control this need to like win this need to and if she's the one making like if he's needing to bend to her he's gonna blow it up mm -hmm. but yeah so even like a, we want like a stubbornness in his voice mm -hmm. yeah yeah anyway Okay, let's try. Oh, I'm sorry. What were you gonna say? Well, I was gonna say if if because uh, any other outcome would would be him admitting, you know, defeat, wouldn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um. All right. Let's talk. Do we want to do cops or villains next? Uh, I don't know. Pick one. Laura, your choice. Um, let's do villains because villains. it's definitely it's it's where we see his true self. Yeah. Are we doing villains stressed or villains confident? So I think there's actually more overlap than we think. I agree. So um, this air of superiority is, it, it's everywhere with the exception of when he's talking to other cops or when he's talking to Argyle. Yeah. This idea that I'm better than the rest of you really shows when he's talking to the villains, regardless of whether he's winning or losing. Yeah, totally. 100%. Yeah. He always knows he's going to be, he always knows he's going to win. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I would say that when he's having these moments of confidence, uh, he likes to tease them. Mm -hmm. Jokes are at their expense. Yep. Which, you know, when you're making, when you're like filling out one of these and you're talking about like, you're filling out your character's humor, it, like just to have a note on building a character wheel, since that's what we're actually supposed to be doing, not just admiring Die Hard. Um, it's important to get specific with this stuff. Like saying he makes jokes isn't necessarily enough to help you write, right? Like, so saying he makes this type of joke in this type of setting is what's actually going to help you modulate a voice in a different setting. Yeah. And he does this not just 
to the villains, but he does it to anyone who he sees has a leg up on him. So he does it when the FBI comes and he's, um, and he's belittling the FBI. Um, we see it when he's talking to, um, to the bad guys. We see it all the time. We see it when um, he's talking to the woman on 911. Yeah, right? I was like, say, go ahead, yeah. Sully. No, I, I was just going to say that same thing. Yeah, because that was clearly a, <laughs> the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we're talking about, you know, blue collar cops, and we're really talking about like people he sees as allies yes. and people he sees as opposition. Yep. It's a great yeah. way to put it. Or, or in his way. Yeah. 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 People that are in his way. Um, I will say when he's talking to villains or people of power, he's very strategic mm -hmm. and he reveals very little, mm -hmm. um, very guarded in his language. Uh, maybe I, I might say rather than I might transition guarded with protective because he kind of like shifts back and forth between those two. And when I think of guarded, I think more of like closed off, but he's not really closed off with villains. He has he's fine to chat them up. He just isn't giving them anything. So there's kind of like a protectiveness to him there. But with that, um, I'm not sure that's totally character driven versus professional driven. And Sully, this is where one can't separate one thing from the other. When you have a character who doesn't compartmentalize his life. So all the things that we're talking about that make him a great cop make him a terrible human being to be gotcha. living with, right? Like the job is the only thing that's important to him at that point. The minute he knows that there's a terrorist in the building, he doesn't even think about Holly. He just goes directly into, I got to save this situation mode. Now, obviously he's thinking about her. We see that throughout, throughout, but he, he doesn't, he doesn't try to save her the way that you would expect some heroes to do it. He just, right. he just goes because he knows he has to, because he, he knows that he has a better chance of winning. And that's where that strategy comes in, whether that's who he is naturally or whether that came out because of his training doesn't actually matter because you can't separate him. It's, it's what her argument is with him from the beginning. Is, oh, right, point. Right, like you're not gonna give me anything, so. Yeah, and I think that's common with a lot of professions, especially when we're writing kind of like general stereotypes, like mm -hmm. doctors tend to merge into their doctor persona. Yep. Um, lawyers. Yeah, lawyers, cops, like these professions that are kind of all defining. Um, people people tend to adapt those personalities um yeah i remember my dad was a doctor and i can remember my friends coming over from uh for just to hang out and my dad did a lot of work in the third world so when he'd come back from being on a trip he'd come out like my friends would come over and he'd shake their hand and he'd shake their hand by grabbing them by the elbow and he'd do this thing where he'd grab them by the elbow and then he'd like grab their joint with two fingers and it was the weirdest thing. And I remember in high school, I was finally like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm checking for TB. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's like, like, we're just hanging out in the kitchen. And like, he can't stop himself. Like it was, you know, one of those weird things. But yeah, anyway, that's just, uh, you know, I think those to just echo what you're saying, like the, the personality and profession merge a lot in our characters, I think. Um, yeah. Especially in a character like this. Now, if you were writing John with his kids, you would see it slightly differently. But we don't ever see him with his kids. I would imagine with his kids, he's more like his wife, with his wife. 
I'd imagine I, if I had to write him with his kids, I would say that he's shut down. Yeah. Yeah. Less picky. Like I would start if I were to build. So if I were to build a column of John with his kids, especially in this early movie where they're little, right. I would start with John with his wife and then I'd take away anything about p- picking fights. Mm-hmm. He's not going to pick fights with his kids, but he's not going to admit he's wrong. He's going to double down on stuff. Mm -hmm. He's never going to raise his voice, but he's going to be exasperated and exhausted all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, so you just pull out all of the stuff that's like the superiority, the need to show that he's in control and that everything else would stay. He'd still be a little argumentative. Mm -hmm. I could totally see him getting in an argument with his daughter about like, are they playing unicorns or right this is right like you see him. <laughs> it's bedtime yeah. she's trying to negotiate and yeah. he's thinking i don't negotiate with terrorists mm-hmm. right like but he wouldn't say that because that would right. be funny and he's not funny when right. he's talking to somebody but when she finally gives in and is walking to bed he'd have a quippy one-liner about yeah. how dads are always right at bedtime right yeah like, because yeah. that's that's again the joke is always at their expense yeah it's always a needling so and that's something i'm gonna add to this thing of power he likes to needle um it, he takes joy in frustrating which is different than his wife right like so if we're modulating his voice like he'll double down on things with his wife but there's a self-hatred about it he's not like taking joy in the fact that he's like in this fight with his wife but man he loves it when he's fighting with people in power it's the best he, it's so fun um for him you can call me roy <laughs> oh yeah it's so bad um yeah all right so let's talk about how his voice changes when he's talking so i would say like again if we're like modulating this and we're moving to from talking to power and opposition to when he's stressed the only thing i would say is jokes disappear so like i'm thinking specifically of like the moment where they've got i can't remember the guys ellis ellis who is her co-worker his wife's co-worker has decided mm-hmm. to like be a um negotiator between the terrorists and john and John very quickly realizes that like, oh, Ellis is going to die. Yep. And all of the jokes go away. And now he's going to th- make threats. But it's not just that. The air of superiority goes away. Yeah. The refusal to admit defeat goes away. It, it, he just becomes silent and commanding. He's no less strategic. He's no less guarded. He just uses way less words. Yeah, totally. And I wouldn't say the superiority goes away. I just say it's muted because it shows up in the threats, right? Like it shows up in the like, if you touch him, I'm going to do this thing to you. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Uh, Okay, let's talk about him with allies and cops. There are so few of them. There's so few of them. There's really just Al and Argyle. Those are it. But I will say he's chatty. Right? Like he's um maybe I'm, not chatty. Chatty's I'd be not careful right. with that word chatty. Yeah, he's not um, chatty. He's he lets his guard down. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. And I, I think it's almost like he needs like a, a short break. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or or maybe some like, you know, uh camaraderie support in between the 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 bouts of action. Yeah. With Alan, um, he actually shows interest in him. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's super true. He actually asks him ask questions. <laughs> he asks him like how many kids he has. Yeah. Yeah. He asks Argyle how long he's been a limo driver. Like he actually cares about mm-hmm. who they are. 
quite perceptive too. Like he he wants to ask him about why he's got a desk job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like when we're moving from the like uh, speaking to power to speaking to blue collar, it's that like guardedness and protectiveness is muted. But the whole like strategic nature of his conversation and who he is, is still present. Mm -hmm. Like he's not stopped paying attention. Right. He's still very aware of what's happening. Right. He's still very like strategic with his conversation and questions. He's just letting them in a little bit more. And he jokes with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that instant, and Jeff, I really like the word you used about allies. It's that instantaneous camaraderie that you understand my plight, I understand your plight, we're doing this together. Yeah. Um, it's very military. Um, you know, two guys from, I mean, Sully, you can talk more to this than I actually can, but I find that when I'm around people that have military history, the minute they find out that they're in the same branch, there's an, there's an immediate like, Connection. you know, yeah, brotherhood, sisterhood, like yep. fellowship of like, you and I are, are the same. And he's, mm -hmm. he has that with like this, these people that he considers allies. Mm -hmm. exactly and and the same thing shows through in um the other movies as well with with similar similar parts yep similar players yeah yeah he's not afraid to express weakness to them um which is an interesting thing about him with allies is that like one of the things that struck me on <laughs> in the whole movie is that he's the whole time he's talking through this radio and they've made it clear that everyone can hear him. <laughs> Hans Gruber can hear him. Al can hear him. The FBI can hear him. The freaking media can hear him. Like everybody can hear him on this radio. And he doesn't have any problem like talking to Al about how he's struggling and how tired he is and how he just needs a break. And the whole time I'm like, he knows like they can all hear him. <laughs> It's just a weird, yeah. And I don't know if that's so much a part of his voice or just a like problem in the movie. But either way, it's uh, he's very like a, he's not afraid to express to his allies how much he's struggling. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So I would argue that that is strategic more than it is Ooh. a character creation. Okay. I would say that is a writer decision to create a, a moment where the character actually breaks character. Oh, gotcha. So you see this a lot in movies like this, um, specifically post-apocalyptic movies you'll see moments where there is romance or weakness where it shouldn't be because the audience needs something to connect to. Mm. Let me rephrase that. Half of the audience needs something to connect to. <laughs> because typically when people are watching movies like this, they're watching it because they either are really excited about it or somebody they're with is really excited about it and there needs to be a moment of redeeming quality. Additionally, that moment where John is talking about weakness, like right after he throws up the Twinkie and is connecting, they use that as the moment for Hans to break in. In fact, yeah. it's the first time Hans breaks in with him and is like, I think he says, touch him, cowboy, touch him, right? Mm -hmm. Like this moment of that and that becomes the turning point in the movie where now they're not just playing strategically against, like they're not just playing two different wars. They're actually now going head to head. Yeah. Without that moment of vulnerability for John right before that happens, the whole rest of the, the movie would have felt very different to the audience. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because it, the I was reading 
um, as I was watching it today, I was reading a little bit about the filming of it. And they were talking about how that if you read the screenplay, it doesn't really match the movie well because there was a lot of improvising. And one of the things was that was improvised- about that. <laughs> what, oh, were you? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that was improvised was this moment where Hans goes to check the explosives and he and uh, John come face to face. It's not originally in the screenplay. They added it when they found out that Alan uh, Rickman, is that his last name? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they found out that he could fake an American accent. They were like, oh, he can fake an American accent. We have to get them in the same locate. Like we have to put them face to face because as they were making the movie, they said they could really feel this need to have them like square off. So mm -hmm. they were like trying to create a, a, a moment in the set, like force a moment where they could be um, eye to eye. But yeah, but like you're saying, Lord, that, you know, watchers like me who are really in it for the emotion and less for the action um really need that like connection between the yep. two characters yeah which is really funny because that's the scene i always get up and go to the bathroom <laughs> for my drink. i like, wasn't gonna sell you out yeah. but i was gonna say i was like all Laura needs is the gun and the explosion and she's gonna right, like but for me it's so out of character for him yeah it's it has to be strategic mm -hmm. so that moment of vulnerability especially because of the strategy and the game that he has going with Hans, like giving him, giving him that ounce because th that he's actually, as he gives up that story, yeah, he's giving up power, yeah, which is actually not true to his character. Not true to who he is. And it, it is a weird thing that like, you know, we've talked, I think the four of us at least have talked about this before that like you have to, the audience, your reader, your watcher, they have to like the main character. You can love to hate the main character, but you have to have a connection with the main yep. character. If if there's no, if John McClane is true to himself through the whole movie and these like breaks in character don't happen, we don't like him and mm -hmm. we don't watch Die Hard because yep. he's the worst so like we need these like moments of weakness uh, of expression so that we can actually connect to yep. who he is that's where the jokes and the humor come in as well yeah again very strategic that if he was just sullen and angry all the time yeah we wouldn't we wouldn't have that and there's a really great moment where um right after the blonde guys right after Carl dies or Carl's brother. I don't know. Yeah. One of them is Carl and one of them is the brother. I'm not sure which one. Carl is the one that lasts to uh, the end who hangs by the chair. Right. Okay. Yeah. So when Carl's brother dies and he is using his semi-automatic rifle to bash the crap out of the copy machine. Yeah. And Holly is sitting with the pregnant woman and she's like, he's alive and and the woman's like what are you talking about and she says only john <laughs> can make someone that mad yeah that is this that is holly pulling and realigning the audience back with john because john has just done something necessary but terrible yeah. right like we're, we're all taught that killing is wrong and he's a cop. He shouldn't be killing these people. He should be handcuffing them to a radiator somewhere. Right. But we need, and then he makes a joke about it. Right. He yeah. puts the ho, ho, ho on the sweatshirt. Right. Like, yeah. um, so he not only violates this trust we have with him as a cop, but he like makes a joke about it so that's where holly needs to realign us as the audience to him yeah 100 percent. yeah that's a great note that, that's deep laura i mean it's die hard it's, deep. <laughs> it's die hard we're drowning in it i've I've, I've i've probably uh watched that movie more times than <laughs> i i will not reveal how many times i've watched that movie that's awesome <laughs> Um, all right. Anything else we want to say about uh, John McClane? <laughs> How um, has this? So, 
I love doing this because this just helps me. I actually do it in my head when I'm watching TV shows. I was finishing the fifth season of Supernatural this weekend. Um, and I was totally doing it for Sam and Dean in my head. I was like, what's their character reel look like? Uh, so so there is a fan, sorry, I gotta, I gotta just jump yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. There is a fantastic scene. Um, I think it's season eight, maybe nine. I haven't gotten there yet. I'm only on five. So it, it's over. It's, it's 10 years ago. You, you spoiler alert. Um, the prophet, there's no a prophet <laughs> later. Um, and the king of hell has the prophet trapped and he has two of his demons playing Sam and Dean. And they come out of this moment with the prophet. And he's like, what are you doing? Sam doesn't do those quippy one-liners. That's a Dean thing. So like they actually play up this moment of like character voice. And I yeah. just, I, I wanted to grab it and like make it your video for, um, but I don't know if you can get copyright. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> yeah, that's really funny. But yeah, yeah but, this moment. Yeah. But all that to say, these are doing these for like movies and stuff is helpful for me because it helps kind of like work that muscle of defining character voice before I try to do it with my own work. Um, John and Faye, y'all get anything out of this today? And you're fine to stay like, I just like talking about Die Hard. But just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just the, yeah, like talking about Die Hard. It, did you just call me John? It's... I did just call you John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tom. I'm Tom, but yeah. That's really funny. Yeah, I was thinking about Die Hard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no worries. Freudian, Freudian slit, but that's why I asked earlier about um, uh, getting this spreadsheet uh, to look at later so I can reflect on it and go back. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it'd be excellent. Yeah, 100%. And I think, um, you know, just working that, like, I find the hardest part of this, like, where I keep getting caught up as I make more and more of these, where I keep getting caught up is that Oh, why did that happen? I keep getting caught up on this, um, the difference between personality and what voice is mm -hmm. and like the difference between and really focusing on like how a voice modulates and how it stays the same. Um, I find that's the, that's the most difficult part of the character wheel is like, I always want to stop at personality. Uh, so moving into like how that voice is, actually playing how that person I was actually playing out into voice is uh is helpful to, for me so yep. one thing I want to add today we spent a lot of time dissecting what John McClane would say not a lot of time talking about how John McClane would say it so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago there are two parts to voice it's the words we use and then the tone with which we present those words. When we, and what I think is really interesting about this character wheel is because the last character wheel we did, we actually focused more on how the character spoke yeah. and less on what the character would say. Um, for a character like John, who is very precise about when they're talking. Strategic is a better word. He's very strategic about everything he says. There's not a lot of modulation in his tone. Mm -hmm. Everything is said as a command, whether it's a joke, whether it's an actual command, whether it's a request, doesn't matter. It all comes out in one tone. So we end up focusing a lot more on the what is being said. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody who has more of a fluctuating personality, we're able to focus more on how they say things. And there tend to be a lot more adjectives on our, um, on our wheel than descriptions. So like there are lots of descriptions here. Yeah. And I think that's, I think, you know, when you have a character like John, now that you say that, Laura, just thinking out loud, I think when you have a character like John, those moments where his tone does change are so powerful, right? Like that's why we notice so much when he's stressed, 
because it's really the the moment where you're talking to his wife, talking to allies, talking to villains, like you're saying, he's always very commanding. But when he gets when he's in this moment of stressed negotiation, that's where like that commanding voice dissipates and you really feel it. You really notice it. Like it just ups that ups the intensity of those moments. Yeah. All right, gang, I'm going to stop sharing uh, and stop the recording. Thanks for doing this tonight. This was fun. It was fun. I like these things. Yeah, me too. I actually can't stop the recording. Laura has to stop the recording. Um, 